We come to the end of the trilogy. Well, as a great person in this book once said, if this is the end, I shall rage towards it. Hello, bookworms and howlers. We are back one more time, guys, to talk the Red Rising Saga. Today, guys, we're going to be closing down that original trilogy with Morningstar, the third book in the original trilogy by Pierce Brown. Guys, it was released in 2016. This was a huge success when it came out. It is the only Red Rising book that has debuted at number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. Back-to-back -back years, it won the Goodreads uh, Choice Award for Best Sci-Fi Novel. And uh, there's a lot of people who are fans of this series. They consider this the best one in the entire series. Does it feel like that for me? We're going to talk about that today. Uh, to, I think for me, I, I still put Golden Sun just a tad ahead of it. But it's close, guys. It's very, very close. And this might be one of those things like when I talk about it a little more, I might actually change my mind on that. Who knows? Who knows? We will see here. But uh, this will be spoiler-free like the first two have been. Uh, I will be having my... Uh, uh, spoiler talk with the fine folks from Howlerpod sometime next week. So you can tune in to that if you want all of the spoilerly goodness that I know that you probably want to talk about if you have read this book. But, guys, before we get into it, we got to begin like usual and talk about what is this book about. Now, risking everything to transform himself and breach gold society, Darrow has battled to survive the cutthroat rivalries that breed society's mightiest warriors, climb the ranks, and waited patiently to unleash the revolution that will tear the hierarchy apart from within. Finally, that time has come. But devotion to honor and hunger for vengeance run deep on both sides. Darrow and his comrades in arms face powerful enemies without scruple or mercy. Among them are some Darrow once considered friends. And to win, Darrow will need to inspire those shackled in darkness to break their chains unmake the world their cruel masters have built, and claim a destiny too long denied and too glorious to surrender, guys. All the way back to 2016 now, this is the end of the original trilogy. This is Morning Star. Now, I think when we talk about what makes it good or bad, beginning with the good here is I think almost every single character that you really are interested in or invested in has a satisfying character arc. And you think back to where the series started and they feel like completely different characters. Everyone has grown either in a good way or a bad way and no one is the same after about the, the I guess about the three or four year span that these books take place. I don't know because there is a little bit of a break. I'm not exactly sure how long the time span is now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, I think I've been thinking ahead too much to Iron Gold which actually takes place 10 years after this one. So I think maybe that's what I'm thinking about. Every single character like I said they feel completely different from where they started. Everyone has grown and it has been uh, growth that's been earned. I never feel like any of this stuff has been like well that seems completely out of character for them. It's stuff that over the course of these books, you felt that change along with them. And it's a, it's a believable evolution. And it's something I think that everybody will be able to get on board with. I love that he keeps you guessing. Even after Golden Sun, I feel like everyone's kind of like on high alert after that ending to where they're like, well, I got to expect the unexpected now. It doesn't matter. what you, if you can be expecting the unexpected and it's still going to surprise you. Because I don't think you're very much going to guess anything that Pierce throws at you. It has some great, great twists and turns. Uh, I, I would say nothing to me... Nothing as shocking as what happened in Golden Sun, but there are some moments where I'm like, wow, I did not see that coming. And I, I, the, the best way, even the gotcha moments that I traditionally complain about, they're really good. And there's a big one in here where I'm like, look, I don't care what you got to do. You best be pulling off some deus ex machina stuff and reversing that. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's got not just things about, you know, where it's characters you care about and, and deals like that. But it's just, just there's big epic moments where you're like, wow, that's going to change everything. And, and uh, yeah, that's just the whole series has been like that. And I think the third book has some of the biggest ones there is. It's got so much emotional weight, you guys. There are some tough goodbyes in here. I talked about losing some characters. There are some tough, tough goodbyes that will really test your allergy threshold. Let's put it that way. But I'll just say, guys, that you know what? Crying is good for your eyeballs, you know? So go ahead and let those tears flow if you got to have them. And I think that just shows he's such a great character writer that you do care. 
uh, when these bad things do happen. But it isn't just all your pals that go. There are some people you, you love to hate they are going to go bye-bye too. This is the grand finale. And uh, regardless of what we know now, at the time, if you were thinking he was ending this after book three, you come to expect there's going to be a lot of finality around here. And I do feel like there is a lot of finality. And uh, I, I love that he just continues to be a ruthless writer. Uh, he does what is known as the hat trick where he's decided, okay, at this, uh, he's doing his outline, and he says, I've got to kill a character here. Who am I going to kill? Well, he puts all the names into a hat, he draws one out, and no matter who it says, that's who he kills off. And I think that's really, really ballsy writing, but it's also, I think, very good creative writing, and you can make sure, okay, I'm going to keep myself honest that I do that, and then I say, okay, well, if I'm struggling with my ideas a little bit, hey, Okay, now I've got to try to figure out a way to kill off this character that I've grown to love. You know, so I, I think uh, he's one of those writers like George R. R. Martin that loves his characters but loves to take them away because obviously he knows he's going to get that kind of visceral reaction and that you will get those reactions a lot. But I think uh, trauma and captivity is a big theme in this book and death, obviously. Uh, there's lots of things where uh, Darrow is looking death in the eyes and he's saying, you know, it's it's never going to be quite what you think. You know, that's how war works is you're there one second, you're gone the next. You know, we're just a blip on the face of the of the planet, you know, and they're going to be around long after we're all, you know, raging death and murder and all those things. Uh, so it's it, it obviously deals with some deep, deep themes. Uh, there is a lot of uh, things in the beginning of this book. I think that'll make you very, very uncomfortable. If you remember where the last book ended. Uh, so you know that uh, our, our heroes aren't going to be having a very good time at the beginning of it. And it's uh, it's it's difficult to read sometimes. But I, again, I think that plays into the theme of the book, uh, you know, the trauma of, of, of being imprisoned and, 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 and being tortured obviously is going to have a great deal of stress on your, your well-being and, and all the way you think about life as a whole and how it can go out just like that. But uh, I like that we get further out into the solar system in this one. You know, we really have just kind of stuck to Mars and Luna. We go out to the Outer Rim a little bit. We're introduced to Romulus, which is basically the sovereign of the Outer Planets. And uh, you get to meet the Moon Lords and all these things and kind of get a taste for those politics and how things work out there beyond the Outer Rim as our heroes are looking for new allies. And I think that it's really, really great because, guys, I will just give you a, a quick little teaser. You might see some of these characters again in the sequels. So it's setting up things. Uh, like I said, even if you don't think that he planned on writing sequel books. I felt like he planted those seeds here. This this series, this trilogy has a lot of finality to it. If you want to stop here, you can. I think that'd be a mistake, and we're going to talk about that eventually. But I, I do feel like he has planted, I can think of five things right now, without even really studying, that he plants in this book that do have significance in the sequel books. But it, it's never one of those things where like, well, that feels unanswered. I think that the best thing about this is it does feel like all your questions are answered in this series, uh, these first three books, all the things you want to know about. So that's why there are a lot of people who have walked away after book number three, because they do feel like it was, uh, you know, the original ending and they wanted to walk away. I get that. But again, I'll touch on that here in a little while. But I, I love getting introduced to all those new characters. It makes, it makes the uh, uh, the solar system feel a lot bigger than it has these first couple of books, getting past Mars, getting past Luna, and uh, yeah, getting to see some of those other things out there, the moons of Jupiter is, is really, really cool. But again, he just continues with the nonstop, relentless action. It's just, he's, he's one of the best at it. And he writes chaos just so well, so well. Like if there's something like a prison break, it's like balls to the wall and it's amazing. It's just, he writes it because he writes in that first person narrative. Uh, you could imagine if you're in the middle of a war, a battle or something like that. Yeah, things are going to be, you're not going to be all coherent. You're not going to be, you're not going to be completely focused on what's going on. Everything's going to be just a disaster. And I think he captures that so, so good. Just the pure chaos of it, especially when everything first starts going to shit. He really always captures that really well. But again, guys, with this, I feel like with Pierce, it's those character moments. And it's those character moments when there's two characters one-on-one -on -one, just talking to each other. There are some scenes with Darrow and Severo in here that are very, very heartfelt. There are some scenes that are very, very tense between those two. There are those moments between Roke and Darrow that might be one of my favorite scenes in the entire trilogy. There's moments with Darrow and Ragnar that's really, really good. I mean, all of, he has one-on-one -on -one moments with all these characters. There's some stuff with him and another character I can't name 
for reasons that you'll understand if you haven't read the book yet. After you read it, you'll understand why I don't mention that person's name. But there are several of those moments. I think uh, Darrow and Cassius, obviously they still have a lot of history going and you're going to get that. I felt like that was a problem. That I, The only problem I had with Golden Sons, I felt like I felt like Cassius kind of got a backseat a little bit. You know, he was at the gala and then he was at the end, but there was a big chunk of that book he was missing. He's back in this book and he plays a very important role. And uh, I, all the stuff I think that you had all those apprehensions and all those wants and desires and, well, something that you wanted to happen between Darrow and Cassius. You're going to get some things. You're going to get a lot of things there. I also think he does a great job of making me like Virginia more because I felt like Virginia was a character I was... It's fine. I mean, besides the fact that uh, she's kind of, uh, you know, Darrow's love interest, I wasn't really, really wild about her. And I think she gets her moments in this book enough to where I, I really, I'm liking the character as more than just a love interest at this point. That was something I was like, I don't want just a character just to be there, to be the girl that our main character has to get. That's what I was kind of worried about the first couple of books. So it, it, don't worry not, worry not. I think Pierce does a great job developing her character quite a bit but uh, so many characters get their moment to shine in this one that you never would have expected and it's just it's so rewarding it really is if you're a character first person but guys again uh i think the the the, the, the action space battles the sword fights the heist the prison breaks all that stuff if you're wanting that same relentless non-stop breakneck pace he's going to give it to you he does stop and take breaths a little more in this book more than he has in the first two but never does it feel like okay can we get on with it no definitely not in fact uh, I'll save one of my criticisms for I have it for it in the in the uh, the not so good parts. But uh, a couple more things. I, I feel like it, it feels resolved enough. Like I said, that you could stop here. Don't think that you should. But it does have a satisfying ending. It does have a a uh, epilogue that'll make you feel like that's a great snapshot. Like uh, if I decide to walk away here, I feel like I will be leaving fulfilled. I will. Whereas I'm like, hey, remember this awesome thing? Yeah, I want more of that awesome thing. And that's what I think that the sequel books are. But what is what is the bad, maybe, or the not so good, or things that maybe just might not work for you? Uh, for me, they really, really bother me. Uh, again, the first person stuff always is just going to be something I'm always just going to completely not be nuts about. The first person narrative, especially when it's a singular POV. I think that that's always going to be something when you try to do so much of the gotcha stuff. Uh, I think there's one in this book where I feel like he kind of shoots himself in the foot a little bit because we do get uh, Darrow's internal monologue. And it's like, why would you be thinking this if, you know, we see that that wasn't the plan later on? That's something that a lot of people have had a hard time ever getting past. Uh, for me, it's like, maybe I misunderstood it because, I mean, I read it again this time. It didn't bother me as much as it did the first time. But I think when, when, when me and HowlerPod uh, talk about it, it's going to come up quite a bit because I know it does bother Aaron quite a bit. And uh, I can see why. I can see why. So again, the problems with the first person narrative, quit quit trying to pull the rug out from under your readers and surprise them uh, when you know you don't need to do that, I don't think. Now, like I said, it, the resolution to it was so great. I think I kind of just like see past the warts on that one. But that is always going to be something that bothers me. It's why I'm glad that in the sequel books, he moves to multi POV. And I think that helps the narrative quite a bit because you can hide a lot of those intentions and plans when you're seeing the character through another character's eyes. So that's something that I felt like was a great, great move for him. Uh, the torture scenes, like I said, they, they can be rough. Uh, it, they're really descriptive. I feel like each one of these books kind of gets darker and darker, guys. But again, this is preschool compared to what's coming in the sequels. So you've been warned. Uh, I don't think they're too bad. There were some people saying like, wow, I, the beginning was just a little too depressing for me. Again, uh, nothing compared to what's coming. But I, I didn't think it was too bad. But I can understand if, you know, some people, I mean, if you're like claustrophobic, I think he catches that really well. What what happens to a character at the beginning of this book? And that, that might be tough for you to read. But again, I don't think that you read a grim darky book without expecting things like that and guys i think after golden sun you can say that this this series is quickly approaching grim dark territory i don't think it's there yet i think it gets there in iron gold and it's 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 firmly entrenched there by dark age but it is a series where the books do get darker and darker so uh, i don't think that's you've even seen the roughest content yet but i will give you that warning that the uh the, the torture scenes can be tough to read and uh yeah it, you can see why certain characters suffer from that old PTSD. Now, look, I gotta say that the final arc is amazing, but I do feel like we've got like this little lull, and then boom, we're in the final arc. And it's like, 
Okay, and, and you will see when you get to the end of it why, you know, because uh, he didn't tip his hand on what the uh, the final battle was going to be kind of thing. You know, he just kind of puts you in the middle of it and lets you figure it out as you go along. So it will seem kind of like, okay, so we're kind of at this lull. I'm waiting to hear what the big plan is, and then boom, they're just doing the plan. You don't know what the plan is. And again, that's just kind of the way that he likes to write, and I'm fine with that. But it, it, it will feel like kind of like rushed in a way to where you're like, okay, I was waiting for this big epic buildup. I've been going two and three quarters books here. I was expecting this big epic buildup and it's just boom, you're just right into it. Now it is very satisfying. So I, I think you can kind of see past it, but I would be lying if I didn't say that felt like a little bit of a, a, a narrative choice. It was like, uh, might've been a little a little spotty, but that's, that's really it. I, I don't have a ton of criticism for this and that's really nitpicking in my opinion. But uh, yeah, the first person thing, that's a me thing. That might not bother you at all. That might just be a me thing. But I know there are a lot of people who do not like uh, some of the internal monologue mistakes. Uh, I don't want to call it a mistake uh, because Pierce Brown's a way smarter writer than I am. But it is something that I feel like I, I, I should bring up. But guys, why should you read it? If you read the ending of Golden Sun, you already know why you should read this. <laughs> Obviously, because I, you've got to know. You got to know what happens next because I think the cliffhanger of book two is an all-timer. It's one of the best I've ever read. But I, I think that, like I said, uh, if Golden Sun was the Empire Strikes Back. This is the Return of the Jedi minus the Ewoks. You know, it, it, it's just, it's everything that you want. It's got all the big resolutions. It's got the big epic space battle. It's got the big resolution in the throne room kind of thing. It's got all that stuff that you loved in Return of the Jedi and other things you didn't like about Return of the Jedi. But it, it's not, you know, it does have kind of a, a nice bow. It's tightly wrapped up. It does feel complete, just like things did at the end of Return of the Jedi. So that's always a comparison I'm going to make, is I feel like this does have the three-act original Star Wars trilogy structure. And never in like a copying kind of way. It's just if you're going to make that comparison... I feel like this is probably the best comparison I've ever seen because I feel like each one of these does line up a lot like those three movies. But uh, yeah, I, the series never outstays its welcome that way. I, I think that because the pacing is so quick, you never ever feel like exhausted to the point of like, oh, I need this to wrap up. Uh, I, I feel like you're actually kind of like holding the clock arm back being like, please don't end because you know it's been such a wild ride. And you want to enjoy your last few moments with these characters. But you know what? Like I said, there are sequel books. So you might see some of them again. So in short, guys, Pierce Brown sticks the landing of this original trilogy. And I think you'll be very, very satisfied if you read all three of them. So as for my final thoughts, guys, uh, look, when I read this for the first time, uh, I didn't want to wait. Uh, Golden Sun, like I said, had one of the best endings I'd ever read. So I immediately grabbed book three and I was glad that I had, you know, had waited until the series was done to pick it up. Because if I'd have had to wait between that one, like I've had to wait between Dark Age and Lightbringer, I, I, I might not, uh, I don't know, I'd, I'd have even more gray than I got right now, I think. Because it's just such a, a crazy, crazy ending. But uh, I, I, many call this their favorite. Like I said, I'm still sticking with Golden Sun, I think, just because that ending is right on there, almost par with like the Red Wedding from A, a Song of Ice and Fire for me. Is like, it's the first time that a book really just shocked me and absolutely just drained me emotionally like that. And I just don't think that you can ever get that kind of high again. This book has so many satisfying moments, so many heartfelt goodbyes, so many moments where I'm like, that's it, that's everything I've been waiting. This culmination is so satisfying. But for me, Golden Sun is just, it's just paced the best. But again, it's like a 1A, 1B between this one and, and Golden Sun. So it really is just that good. It's just it's such a satisfying conclusion. And uh, yeah, like I said, many have told me that they stopped here. And uh, look, it's like I understand if you say you want to wait for the sequel books to be done before you read them because they are very cliffhanger -y. I get that. But when people, I've had so many tell me, oh, I just stopped after Morningstar because I felt like it was a satisfying ending. And I'm going to be making a video sometime uh, before I review Iron Gold talking about why I think, basically, uh, you know, should you read the Red Rising sequels? I'm going to lay everything out and you can decide, hey, does that sound like a reason I would like to read the Red Rising sequels? If so, you know, that's the video that I think that you guys should watch. But like I said, guys, I'll be talking spoilers with Ben and Aaron from HowlerPod uh, next week, uh, that Wednesday, April the 5th. We'll be doing that live at 7 o'clock Houston time. I, I, there's nothing I love more than talking to those two about one of my favorite series of all time. And we're just getting closer and closer and closer. Every time we talk, it's like, oh my God, eventually we're going to be talking about a new 
Red Rising book, and I cannot wait to do it. So guys, that was Morningstar. What did you think of the trilogy? Did you enjoy it? Are you planning to keep going? Are you going to wait and let me try to sell you on reading the sequel books? Let me know down below, guys, and I will talk to you there.